Good afternoon. My name is Saida Torres and I'm the Texas editor for the ProPublica Texas Tribune Investigative Initiative. We're so glad that you could be here with us this afternoon for a conversation that is incredibly important. I say so as a former education reporter who, you know, believes that these conversations are the ones we should be having frequently uh, and um, just very thrilled to have everyone here. We're going to wait a minute or so for a few people to join us um, and then we'll get started. In the meantime, though, <clears throat> a quick note that this event is being recorded and a link to the video will be emailed to everyone who registered. Closed captioning of the program is also available and can be enabled by clicking on the closed caption option on the bar towards the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to ask a question during today's session, click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen to submit it to us. Okay, <clears throat> it looks like we have enough people to get started. Once again, uh, for those folks who are just joining us, I wanna thank you for spending time with us today on this very important conversation about school vouchers. I'd like to invite our featured reporters to join us on the screen. Let me introduce each of them first, Alec McGillis, who focuses on gun violence, economic inequality, and the pandera pandemic era school cr schools crisis. Eli Hager, who covers issues affecting children and teens in the Southwest, and Jeremy Schwartz, who covers democracy and education in Texas. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Eli, I'd like to kick off the conversation with you. You're in Arizona, and this is where educational savings accounts originated. Can you describe how the use of voucher-like programs and the terminology used to describe them has changed over time? Yeah, so voucher programs began in a more targeted way. Um, one of the first programs was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and it was targeted specifically toward students from uh, lower in income or underperforming schools. Um, and it was meant to give those students and their families a school choice, an option to, to go somewhere else. Um, in uh, that, that concept has developed over time though, and it, it's become this notion of education savings accounts, uh, which is much more popular today. So the first state to use that uh, terminology was Arizona where I live um, um, in uh, 2011, I believe. And it, that again, started out as a targeted program. Um, it was just for students uh, with, with disabilities so that potentially their parents could send them uh, somewhere, a, a school, a private school that had services that they needed. Um, that expanded and expanded and expanded and new groups were added, such as students from underperforming schools, um, Native American students, uh, students who had a foster care background. And now ultimately we've, uh, in 2022, Arizona passed the nation's first universal uh, ESA program which means that uh, any family, uh, any parent, no matter how affluent or, or what type of school their child is going to, or even if their child's already going to a private school, can now get money to pay for private school tuition or um, after school programs that are educational or um, if they're homeschooling supplies that they need for homeschooling. So that's also what differentiates it from a classic voucher. A voucher it goes directly to the private school for tuition and ESA or education savings account is an account that fills with state taxpayer dollars um, that the parent can use however they see fit, essentially. Alec, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what the arguments for and against vouchers and voucher-like programs have been and how they've evolved over the years. Sure. I mean, they really have evolved quite a bit. Early on, the, the argument for vouchers was basically a uh, free market ideology one, that competition was going to help improve all schools. If we expose public schools to competition, that will help everyone. That was sort of the Milton Friedman argument back in the 60s and 70s. That then evolved into uh, basically a social, social justice kind of argument in the cities where these vouchers started. Eli mentioned Milwaukee. Cleveland was another city where they started out in the early 90s. And there the argument was, this is a way to help kids get out of failing public, urban public schools, get them out of those you know, trapped environments into, into better situations. That then evolved into more of a kind of, I guess what you could call kind of a parents' rights argument um, in the last couple of decades that 
parents should have the right to choose what's best for their children. Everyone's paying taxes. Parents should be able to send their kids to any school they want and the money should follow the student even if it's going to a private school. Um, the argument against vouchers has, has stayed more steady over the years. It has basically been that they are going to undermine the public schools that are a, a foundation of our, of our democracy, of our civic community, um, that they are in a sense that the notion of, of school choice is not really true choice because it's the schools, the private schools that are getting to choose their students. So you're left with uh, public schools that have kind of left with the kids that have not been chosen. So you end up with these real deep inequities in that sense. Um, and then to the extent that these vouchers are helping kids get into private religious schools, that that's raising basic church state separation questions. So really the argument um, in, favor, in favor of the vouchers has evolved probably more than the argument against them. And like as we talk about the evolution, you walked us through a good amount of time, but can we talk a little bit about the pandemic and how it affected uh, this discussion around school vouchers? Definitely. I mean, there's been a, the pandemic and the pandemic school closures basically provided a massive opening for, for vouchers um, to, to be expanded nationwide. Um, voucher proponents could say, look, you left schools, you, the public school system, left us kind of high and dry. You left the schools closed in many cities for as much as a year and a half. Um, and so families mo now more than ever need to have other options. They were left kind of just without in-person schooling while many private schools stayed open. So we now need the vouchers even more in those sorts of situations. On top of that, many parents during the pandemic were watching that Zoom school that their kids were in. Um, at home, and they saw they had a more of a direct glimpse of their kids' schooling, their kids' curriculum than they had before. And many parents didn't like what they saw. They didn't like whatever kind of progressive political um, agenda they perceived. Or, um, you know, uh, we have to remember, of course, this was happening during the George Floyd uh, moment as well, where you had a real up after Floyd's murder, a real upwelling of of sort of um, you know, progressive ideas um, in school generally. And so a lot of parents saw that during the pandemic, they rebelled from that and that further fueled this, this, this ex expansion that we've seen in the last few years. It's, it's the great irony that, that you had Betsy DeVos in there as education secretary, someone who has pushed for vouchers for years. And in her tenure, there was a massive uh, boost for vouchers but not through any real doing of her own, because, simply because the schools were closed, stayed closed for, for so long in those two years. Jeremy, Alec talked a bit about like what parents were seeing and how parents were reacting. But in Texas, you actually got to see this being used as part of the strategy to breathe life into a voucher debate um, that for a long time had stalled, uh, in part because of opposition from rural Republicans. I think we can talk a bit about that more later, but can you walk us through how it played out in Texas? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Texas is, it is the, the largest Republican led state uh, without a voucher program. Um, and so there has long been a lot of interest in bringing vouchers to Texas. Um, the effort goes back, you know, two or three decades at least um, among um, sort of far right donors in Texas have, have long had this as a goal. Um, politicians like Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick have, have fought for this, uh, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, but as you said, the, the issue did sort of die out for all intents and purposes by by 2019 the 2019 legislative session the the voucher issue barely made a a, a blip um that that summer um and uh you know some folks were, were sort of seeing it as a, as a dead issue um a year later uh with covid and a lot of the stuff that alec was was talking about the infrastructure that had been there advocating for 
for vouchers in Texas was was really quick to uh, connect the dots between sort of some of the issues that popped up with COVID and and school closings um, and, and, and Zoom classes, uh, but also this sort of fear over, you know, the teaching of race and gender um, and, uh, you know, by the middle of 2020, we were seeing um, this effort to, to, to craft the narrative that vouchers, school choice is the solution to all the ills that uh, in public education that COVID has, has revealed. Uh, and, and one of the biggest uh, uh, proponents of this was a group called the Texas Public Policy Foundation, which at the time was led by a man named Kevin Roberts, um, some of the folks watching may may know Kevin Roberts now leads the Heritage Foundation, which is um, uh, pushing uh, uh, Project 2025, sort of a, a, a blueprint for a potential Trump second term, um, and which does include, uh, you know, voucher, uh, a push for vouchers. Um, and Roberts, you know, quickly saw uh a window in, in Texas to make it happen. But what was sort of interesting about Roberts was he, he very clearly saw and expressed that for him, vouchers um, were an ideological uh, alternative to public schools. And that public school, he, he, he drew a very stark contrast between the woke education students would get at public schools versus a presumably more traditional or religiously minded education in private or religious schools. Um, and that was a an argument that caught quite a bit of um, uh, momentum. And so within really just a matter of a year, this sort of dead dead bill, you know, had new life. Alec, like, if we could go back a bit further, I wonder if we can, talk about in in the 1990s voucher proponents initially touted them as a way for disadvantaged students in struggling urban districts to get a better education how has the recent is expansion of vouchers changed not only the demographics but also the politics and the geography surrounding the voucher debate yeah it's, it's really fascinating how things have evolved politically and demographically um, just recently with this massive expansion for many years, you know, going back to the early 90s, you, you essentially had an alliance between some urban families, mostly African-American families in Cleveland and Milwaukee, who were in favor of vouchers because they thought their kids deserved this chance to go to, to private schools. And, and then they were allied with conservative think tanks and lawyers um, who believed strongly in vouchers and were pushing this um, nationally at the, at the legal level. And, but that was really, and then you had uh, the opposition was urban families and legislators who worried about the effect on, on public schools, but there was not much of a sort of, didn't go much beyond that. Um, now with this huge expansion to the point where vouchers are universal in basically a dozen states, you have, it's become a much more middle-class, even upper middle-class suburban constituency that families that are this is the key thing. And most in the states that have expanded vouchers in a, in a huge way, like Arizona, Florida, Ohio, you have the most of the, of the families benefiting from the vouchers who receiving the vouchers are families who are already in private schools, um, already have their kids in private schools. In many, many cases, they are middle and upper middle class families um, who were affording private schools before and are now getting these vouchers um, to help pay for that, that education. So it's completely changed that the sort of the, the demographics and politics of, of this constituency. Meanwhile, you have this very interesting resistance still among rural areas in these expansion states, who where areas that are generally the most conservative parts of these states that on this issue are, are taking, are, are basically opposing the conservative pro-voucher line because, because people in these communities know how important private schools, uh, public schools are to their community. 
It's the, in many cases, the largest employer. It's the center of the community. It's Friday night football. It's the holiday concerts, all of that. And they also know that they have very few private schools, if any, in their areas. And so that money, that taxpayer money that's going to vouchers now, isn't going to be coming to them. It's going to be going to these generally middle upper middle class families off in the suburbs, in the metro areas. It's not coming to them. They're barely getting any of it. Even if they were to get some new private schools in their area that suddenly would pop up to get this money, they worry about the effect that that would have on their public schools, public schools that their families went to for generations, public schools that are not really in the, seen in the community as being overly progressive or somehow radical. They're just the beloved school where Mrs. Johnson taught you and taught your kids and taught your granddad. And it's not, um, and so it's just really seen as this beloved institution. So you have this very interesting inversion now where many states, the reddest parts of the states are posing some of the strongest resistance to this conservative plank. That was a great overview. And I think there are uh, pieces of that that we'll want to kind of pull at as we move along. One of those is, is this discussion about money. Um, Eli, you've reported on Arizona where universal vouchers allow any parent to spend voucher money on anything education related. That brings up two questions. The first is, how have school vouchers impacted state budgets in states like Arizona? And the other is, if you are able to use voucher money on anything that is deemed education related, has this in any way allowed for grift or misuse of taxpayer funds? Sorry, I had to unmute there. A lot. <laughs> Yes, um, it has definitely affected budgets, although of course we're just seeing the beginnings of that. Um, Arizona's universal program just started in 2022 and the other 11 or so states that have followed suit in, in various ways um, are, are even more, are, are even newer programs. So we're still we're still watching. Um, but, but kind of by definition, if you make a program that open-ended, um, it's gonna have an effect on the budget. So we're, um, here in Arizona, uh, we're using state money, and that's, um, I should note, this is from the state budget, not there's, these programs aren't funded by federal money or local property taxes, the, the way that um, public schools, a part of their funding comes from those sources as well. Anyway, so this, the state is uh, spending money on any parent who wants a voucher um, up to up to tens of thousands of dollars, depending on the, on the family. Um, and that parent or parents can use it on just about anything if they can make a case that it's education related. So that could be tuition to a private school. That could mean um, after school programs. And here in Arizona, we're seeing parents spend on all sorts of after school programs. Um, you know, some of them, what you might predict, um, sports and tutoring, others a little bit more outlandish, like ninja warrior training and cowboy school and um, things like this that they're defining as educational. Um, and then you can also, if you're a homeschooling parent, spend the money on um, supplies and home appliances and things that you say that you need for um, educating your student at home. Um, so, so if you make it that open-ended and you, even as Alec pointed out, the money's even available to parents who were already paying private school tuition and now this is new money just helping them pay tuition that they were already paying. We as taxpayers weren't paying private schoolers tuition before. So um, that's going to be new money coming out of the state budget. Um, proponents of uh, education savings accounts or empowerment scholarship accounts as they're called here in Arizona um, have made the argument that it shouldn't cost that much money um, because the money should essentially follow students from the public school. Uh, so the, this was always the, the, the reasoning around the funding of vouchers was that, you know, we're already funding a, a student to go to public school, all of us as taxpayers are. Um, and so if, if, if a public school student and their family, if they wanna go to private school instead, you're just kind of, it's called like backpack funding. The funding follows you in your backpack from the public school to the private school. Um, and and that and in that case, the, the, these programs would actually save money um, because the amount of the voucher, the ESA, is usually less than all the money that we spend on a student to go to public school. Um, but what we're seeing, as Alec also pointed out, um, is that um, a disproportionate number of 
families that are using this money so far in Arizona, their kids, like I said, were already in private school. Um, so they're, or were already homeschooling, uh, you know, out of their own pocket. And so this is new money. Um, uh, it's not following the kid from a public school. This is new money that the taxpayers are paying um, to private school parents and homeschooling parents. And so long story short, the result of that has been that um, Arizona has faced a significant budget shortfall. There's some argument about what the causes of that have been. Part of it was certainly that there was an income tax cut a few years ago under the previous um, governor's administration, Doug Ducey, um, that cut, that made a flat income tax and reduced uh, taxes on the wealthy to less than 3%. Um, and so that created a big part of the budget problem. But another part of it was that this program, the ESA program was predicted um, originally um, to cost about $65 million last year. Instead, last year it cost $332 million um, because all these private school and homeschooling parents are using the money um, and that led to a lot of budget cuts here, um, uh, which were pretty devastating, actually. And I, I think Florida and some of these other states are starting to see some some similar issues with the budget. Jeremy, while Arizona led the way toward pushing for universal vouchers uh, and a universal voucher program, Texas was the largest GOP holdout in many ways because rural Republicans had opposed uh, voucher pushes over the deck over several decades. Um, but things changed significantly this year. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what happened. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, as you say, rural Republicans had been the, the bulwark uh, preventing vouchers, you know, for at least 15, 20 years in Texas. Um, and, and that didn't so much change. Um, we didn't see lawmakers changing their minds. Uh, but what did change in a big way was uh, the Texas governor, Greg Abbott, um, underwent this sort of evolution where he, he had always been sort of lukewarm on vouchers. He, you know, had, had supported at one point a voucher system for special ed students, um, but had never been, you know, at the forefront of the of the movement uh, to bring vouchers to Texas. Um, but at the end of 2022 and and throughout last year and 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 definitely this year, he has transformed into the single biggest uh, and most important supporter of vouchers in Texas. Um, you know, there's a couple reasons that that may be. Um, folks have have talked about, um, uh, you know, if if given sort of the state of play in the Republican Party, um, you know, it, to be a, a a powerful figure nationally uh, as a governor, you sort of need to have a a voucher win uh, in your on your belt. Um, and so you see other governors like Ron DeSantis in Florida, you know, accomplishing this uh, and um, uh, Abbott still still had not. Um, he was also pressed from the right during his primary by two challengers that um, he, he accused him of being soft on vouchers. Um, and so that may have played a role, but, but regardless, he, um, you know, made this transformation and um, spent most of last year um, campaigning for school vouchers across the state. Um, and when when the legislature still, despite all, all those lobbying efforts, uh, voted down vouchers uh, this past year in November, I believe, um, the governor transitioned to uh, a, a role in which he was going to target and eliminate uh, those rural Republicans who had voted against vouchers. Uh, and in many cases, those lawmakers were, were people who were in lockstep with the governor on virtually every other issue, the border, uh, property taxes, um, but happened to uh, not not favor vouchers in large part because of the opposition they were hearing from their home 
home districts. Um, but uh, quite a bit of money uh, came into these uh, primary challenges, both from within Texas and millions from outside of Texas, from national pro-voucher forces, PACs connected to Betsy DeVos. Um, a sort of overwhelming amount of money came in. Um, interestingly, the 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 um, campaigns were were not played out against the the issue of vouchers. Um, the ads that went up were attacking these anti-voucher candidates for being soft on the border or raising property taxes, um, uh, not really attacking them on their on their um, position on vouchers. Um, but it, it was a quite successful effort um, uh, and uh, a good half a dozen uh, sitting lawmakers were were defeated and the governor now believes he does have the votes um, to finally pass vouchers this coming session uh, which will, which will be next year. Jeremy, just to stay on this a bit more, um, you know, state and national attention has really focused mostly on, you know, this fight uh, in the state legislature. Um, but you wrote about an interesting case where you had a rural Republican who was elected to her local school board in large part by promoting theories that public schools were indoctrinating children. Um, once she took office, however, she said that she came to a realization that there was a larger effort of afoot to push rhetoric and candidates that would sow distrust in public schools in an effort to push vouchers. I wonder if what is the connection, if any, between the push for hard by hardline conservatives to take over school boards and the voucher effort? So, you know, I think what we found in reporting on this issue for, for the better part of a year here in Texas is that there is a lot of overlap between uh, the voucher movement and efforts by far-right Republicans to take over school boards in Texas, especially suburban school boards. Um, the same issues of LGBTQ library books and CRT and curriculum, uh, these culture war issues sort of fuel both of these, um, these, these sort of parallel efforts. Um, and, and it's to the point where we are seeing pro-voucher school board members being elected, which um, is sort of an unthinkable thing, you know, to go back before the pandemic, it, one could, couldn't really imagine that happening, uh, in large part because the trustees, one of their main um, tasks is uh, to look out for the financial well-being of, of districts. Um, and this question of whether vouchers will um, decrease funding for individual districts. Um, so yeah, that was sort of the the, the, the background. And uh, we, we covered a, a school trustee in Granbury, Texas, which is a rural area near Fort Worth named Courtney Gore, who was one of the first sort of generation of parental empowerment candidates um, who was campaigned on a, on a platform that kids were being indoctrinated um, and that we needed to get the CRT out of the schools. Um, but what made Courtney different was that when she did get elected, she actually went to the curriculum and, and took a look at it to, to try to find where this sort of nefarious uh, indoctrination was hiding so she could show people and sort of root it out. Um, and to her surprise, she didn't find um, that stuff. Um, she was targeting a curriculum called Social and Emotional Learning, SEL, which has been the target of, of some far-right groups, uh, Moms for Liberty among them, who believe SEL is sort of where this Marxist indoctrination is, is, is coming in through. Um, and Courtney, as she went through the, the lesson plans, um, said that she didn't find any any evidence of that and instead found really what in her mind was was lessons on how to be a good friend or a good person uh, generally. Um, so she went to bring sort of this good news back to her 
backers, the, the folks that had encouraged her to run who were part of this far right movement in Hood County, her home county. Um, and she said they could care less about that. They wanted to keep making it an issue. Um, and in fact, wanted her to stop talking with any of her fellow board members uh, who they said were, were filling her head with lies. Um, and uh, Courtney, though, uh, you know, couldn't sort of take that um, uh, as it was. And, and she actually went public herself with what she had found and what she had not found. And also the fact that her backers were not willing to, to listen to this. Um, and she also began talking about what, what she was seeing um, was connections between her backers and um, billionaire uh, donors in the state, uh, evangelical donors who had long pushed for um, vouchers in Texas for, you know, since the 1990s, um, were getting involved in, in Little Granbury, Texas, um, you know, funding uh, to some extent uh, these campaigns. And she sort of, over time, came to this conclusion that her her own campaign, you know, she was she was recruited to run uh, alongside another mother, and that those campaigns were part of an effort to um, decrease trust in local school boards, especially in in rural areas like Granbury, where if you can get school board members who are saying there's pornography in the library, there is, you know, racist stuff in the curriculum. Um, you know, all this den of uh, iniquity is happening in the local school district. Folks that have, you know, as, as Alec and Eli have talked about, who, especially in rural areas who have supported uh, public education might start to rethink that. Um, yeah. And uh, um, so, so, so that is uh, um, uh, kind of her conclusion to that. And, um, you know, I think we, we still uh, continue reporting on this and sort of look for, for some of these links, um, but there's definitely uh, an overlap between yeah. the voucher effort and, and school board races. Um, we have a few more questions to get through. I think we want to, move through them a little bit more quickly so we can get to questions from the audience. Um, but I do think they're important questions. So just want to kind of chat really quickly with Eli and Alec. Um, Eli, um, I feel like this seems like the most basic question, but are vouchers accessible in a practical way to low-income families the way that they were initially you know, intended to do? Right, this was always supposed to be a way for low-income families to send their kids to a better school, right? But so far what we're seeing from our reporter is no, um, these voucher programs are not accessible in a practical way to lower-income families. That's what we're doing a big analysis of that right now in Phoenix. Um, you know, a lot of lower-income families are actually very interested in the idea of school choice, according to surveys that have been done and also just the extensive interviews that I've been doing. But, um, Many people have told me that, like, upon their further research into the program, it's just not feasible. So, first of all, we've mapped all the private schools in Maricopa County, which is where Phoenix is, and they're very disproportionately in wealthier areas like Scottsdale and Paradise Valley. Um, it doesn't make much sense for these private schools to build in the poorer areas of, of a city, so that so the schools end up building in in the wealthier areas. So, from a lower income parents perspective, um, even if you've got access to this voucher, how will you get your kids to that far away private school, uh, you know, over in Scottsdale, will you like send them in Ubers every day um, for the whole year? How much would that cost? Send them on hours of um, city buses, drive them every day, even if you've got a job with long hours. And there's like all these other considerations that families have been bringing up. Will meals be provided the way that they're required to be at the public school? Um, Will there be branded uniforms that you have to buy? Um, you know, do you think your kids will be treated fairly in an environment where they're surrounded by better off um, students? Uh, will there be English language learning education provided the way that's also required at public schools if you're a Spanish speaking family? Um, 
and yeah, so and so the result of this is like we we found that there's zip codes in South Phoenix, which is a lower income area, where less than 0.2 percent of families are using this program, and there's zip codes in Scottsdale where over 25 percent of families are using the program. Um, let me ask one final question, and then I do want to move to the audience um, questions. Alec, can you talk a bit about your reporting in Ohio? You know, Eli talked a little bit about the intention and, you know, the not meeting the full intention. You talked to people in Ohio uh, where even very affluent parents who send their kids to private schools and neither need or want assistance have been leaned on by schools to take the money. Um, as part of that reporting, you spoke with a mother who sends her child to a Jewish school, but who opposed its efforts to get parents to apply for the state's voucher program. She said to you, for this public money to go to kids uh, to get a religious or education is incredibly wrong. I absolutely don't wanna pull any money out of an underfunded school district. Why doesn't the separation of church and state prevent using public funds to pay for religious schools? And, and talk a little bit about the phenomenon here. Yeah, it's, it was fascinating. There are these letters going out and I got the letters and they're in, they're in the article um, from these schools, um, almost entirely religious schools that are getting the, the vouchers in Ohio, mostly Catholic, some, some Jewish schools as well from the school leaders saying, you basically, you must apply for this voucher. Um, if you're especially, definitely if you're getting financial aid from us, you have to apply for the voucher. And if you don't want to, you're gonna have to come talk to Father Bob about it, basically. Like it's, it's very strong pressure. Um, and some parents, liberal parents are opposed to this. They say, I made the choice to send my kid to private school. Um, that's best for my kid, but I don't want it to be, to be harming kids in the community. Um, and, and so there's this, yes, this broader question about, about church and state and what, what has happened over the last, basically the last two decades is that there's been a series of rulings by the Supreme Court that have paved the way for this. Um, the most crucial one early on was in 2002, Supreme Court ruled 5-4, um, William Rehnquist writing the decision, Sandra Day O'Connor supporting it, that, um, that the Cleveland voucher program was okay. Um, their argument was basically, um, these vouchers, uh, even though they're mostly going to religious schools, they could, in theory, go to non-religious private schools. So in that sense, it's all just about choice. It's not really about, this is not trying to fund religious schools. It's just choice. And, and so it's okay. Um, more recently, there was a big ruling in Maine a couple of years ago where the court basically said that Maine, Maine had a program sending state money to private schools for kids in rural areas where there are very few public schools. Um, they could take money, state money to go to private schools, but Maine was forbidding them to use that money for private, for religious schools. And once again, the court led by John Roberts struck that down. Um, so there's been this real push, you know, in the name of, of basically religious freedom. Um, in a way, the religious freedom part of the First Amendment has sort of outweighed the no establishment of official religion part of the First Amendment in a, in a sense, and has completely opened up the floodgates for these programs from a legal perspective. Great, thank you all so much. It, um, it's been so insightful so far. I wanna just go straight into questions from our audience, uh, both those that were submitted ahead of time and those that we are getting as we speak. Uh, Eli, can you address, uh, I think one of the biggest questions here for anybody is, what do we know about how school vouchers affect school performance, right? And what academic standards are there for schools receiving vouchers? Yeah, so the, some of the evidence on some of those early programs that we've been mentioning throughout the panel, um, some of those smaller, more targeted programs was mixed and, and maybe even good um, in, in terms of the academic performance of students who were coming from underperforming public schools um, and we got a very targeted voucher to go to um, a, a, a private school. Um, but the evidence on universal voucher programs, which is the more recent phenomenon uh, there, there's not enough evidence yet, because um, again, these programs are new, but it hasn't been great so far. Um, there's been a couple of studies showing learning loss um, equivalent to that. Um, after um, like Hurricane Katrina, there was one study that compared 
um, a large group of kids moving from public to private school is using a like an open ended um, uh, voucher program that showed that big of a of a learning loss. Um, so we don't know yet, but it's 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 mixed and it hasn't been great so far for the universal programs. As for standards, I think that's really the issue. Um, there there really aren't any um, for private schools. Obviously, um, you know the, the, there there are certain things that they have to do as a school, but there's no there's no state um, oversight to speak of. They don't have to take standardized tests the way that public schools have been kind of drilled into doing ever since No Child Left Behind and and even before that. Um, they they don't have to show their budgets, make their budgets accessible to the public, or respond to records requests from reporters like us. Um, so, some private schools aren't accredited by an accreditation body, so I think that's one of the biggest differences there. And it's and so the answer to the first part of the question is difficult because of the second part of the question. There's not a lot of access to information about private schools, um, and so it's hard to say for sure how well they're doing. Yeah. I Another question that I think is a big question for people uh, is, have there, and Alec, I wonder if you could answer this, have there been any academic studies on private school tuition increases post-voucher implementation? There, um, there have been no real academic studies that I'm aware of because this is all happening so quickly. This expansion has been so rapid the last couple of years, but we're already seeing journalistic reports of of increases in, in some states. There was a good story out of Oklahoma just this week um, showing sharp increases, tuition increases at the private schools there as parents are getting these vouchers and are thus able to afford to pay more. In Ohio, um, last I checked, there were not many big increases happening yet, which I think is partly schools kind of restraining themselves somewhat, knowing that they've become very targeted um, politically, um, very exposed politically. And if, they, if people see them jacking up their tuition, um, to sort of um, grab this this voucher money, and, and uh, that 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 might become a problem for them. The fact is, in Ohio, this program is now costing a billion dollars a year. Taxpayers, if they've now hit the billion dollar a year mark for this, that's out of a total education budget of about thirteen billion dollars. And so, there's going to be this is going to become a real budget fight in a lot of these states. And I think some of the pro these schools, mostly religious schools, are are worried about seeming to try to take advantage of the vouchers by jacking up tuition. Eli, a much more targeted question about tuition to Arizona, which is how does tuition for Arizona public school, uh, private schools compare to the dollar amount of the vouchers? Um, it's it's often significantly higher. Um, we're trying to gather the, the tuition rates of all of the private schools in, in, in our area and to be able to calculate a, a good median, but often the, the kind of median uh, ESA amount is about $7,000 and an awful lot of private schools across the valley, it's what we call it here, the valley, um, are, are 12, 13, $14,000. So again, if you're a if you're a lower income parent, it's like giving you a 50% um, off discount to Saks Fifth Avenue. Well, you're probably gonna still shop where you already shop. This one's for whoever wants to take it. Do the private schools that accept vouchers also have to accept any students who present themselves with a voucher or are there barriers to admissions for kids who are not English speakers, differently abled, religiously divergent uh, from a religion-based school? I could take that one. Um, it's, as I you know, sort of said at the outset, ap they absolutely do not have to take anyone. And this is why, um, in, in a sense, school choice is is a misnomer um, or a, an ironic term because the real choice does reside with the private schools who still get to choose who they're going to take. Um, and it's why in a lot of cities, a lot of communities, this, 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 this expansion of vouchers really does threaten to leave the public schools with an even more um, disadvantaged population, essentially, you know, even more uh, kids in needs of, of, of special education um, second English ESL learners, um, there's, there's going to be an even greater bifurcation in that sense because the private schools are able to, to pick who they want. I love the thoughtfulness of these questions. Um, again, anybody who wants to pick it up. Have any colleges joined in on this discussion based on their experience with kids coming from voucher-supported schools and those from the conventional school programs? Do 
Do we know of any? No, I'm not I, aware. I, I think, I think it's, it's one, one of many questions here. Yeah. Yeah, one of many questions here where we're kind of waiting to see the results. There's a lot of predictions being made about, you know, how, how students will be performing when they're getting to the college level. Um, and maybe colleges would have something to say then. All right. How does one follow the money with vouchers? Where does money come from? What is the process to apply and who gets the funds? Are there annual limits? Uh, are they any? Is there any oversight on expenditures? And if by what agency? Okay. The ultimate question, how do we follow the money? Uh, we've already talked about not fully being able to follow the academics, right? How do we follow the money? Well, some parts of that question I can answer because they're related to the budget issues. So um, in Arizona, absolutely anybody can, you know, you could be the, the wealthiest person in Arizona and you could still get a voucher. There are some limits in these other states, even though we're, we're kind of bulking, uh, grouping them all as universal voucher programs. But for example, Utah recently passed a universal ESA program where if it goes over the amount that the state had planned to spend, then there is kind of a priority list for who can get a voucher next and it's lower income students or students who have already been in the program or have had siblings in the program, things like that. But for the most part, there's no there's no there's no real cap on on what can be spent, and this is all coming out of the state budget, not not from federal dollars or, or local property taxes. So the same funding that the state is here in Arizona, you know, we had to make some cuts to highway funding, uh, water projects, uh, the, the university system, things like that, in part in order to pay for um, you know all of the money that was going to the ESA program. It's very, hard, it's, it's very hard to follow the money to the actual schools. That's something a lot of reporters are now trying to do is figure out how many schools, what schools are getting how much of this money. And that's, states are holding that information very, very closely. Jeremy, I'm going to end with this question for you. Um, through your reporting, what do you see, what does your reporting tell you uh, is the end game for funders supporting vouchers? Is this an effort to undermine and weaken public schools and support for public education? I mean, in a way, yeah, in Texas, that's sort of the $64 million question. Um, and there's definitely folks that believe, um, you know, that, that the second shoe to drop is to undermine public education. Um, a, a lot of the same folks that have been pushing for vouchers all these years sort of in parallel have been pushing for an end to property taxes in Texas, uh, local county property taxes, which are the lifeblood of school districts, um, uh, which are already, um, you know, in, in dire financial um, trouble right now in Texas, um, sort of related to the impending uh, voucher vote. Um, but something like that, if that was to go forward in conjunction with a voucher, uh, especially a universal voucher program, um, I think would have long lasting and, and deep effects, uh, on, on public education, um, that I'm not even sure we, we know how deep that would go, um, but that, is a is is a fight for another day on on uh, property tax, but it is out there looming and waiting. That's unfortunately our time for today. Uh, I just wanted to thank the panel for the really insightful discussion, as well as the audience for joining us and for your thoughtful questions. Again, this event is being recorded, so you'll receive an email with the full video of today's discussion and a link to our event survey has been added in the chat box. Um, we'd really appreciate your feedback. Uh, it helps us as we are planning these events. Uh, and just finally, from all of us at ProPublica, thank you for joining us and have a great evening. We look forward to seeing you next time.